Now this morning, I am beginning a new series, a little bit different than um, probably anything I've done before. So I, I'm beginning a new series this morning called Classic Rock. And, and what I've done is taken song titles from Classic Rock titles and, and how we can use them in, um, or how I can use that title in a scripture reference. So we're going to do both Old and New Testament, but this morning is from, will be from the New Testament. As I gave you a preview last week, this morning is a song title from the Beatles. By 1968, the Beatles were at the absolute height of their fame and popularity. As they were known, four lads from Liverpool had conquered the entire world, basically, in the musical industry for sure. In May of that same year, John Lennon divorced his first wife to marry uh, his girlfriend at the time, a Japanese artist named Yoko Ono, who became famous in her own right. But he was finalizing the divorce from his first wife in May of 1968. His bandmate and friend and co-writing partner, Paul McCartney, felt bad about this divorce. His friend was getting a divorce. In particular, Paul felt bad about the first family, the first wife and John's young son named Julian. And so Paul went to visit them one day. He drove to their house and visited with the first wife, Cynthia, visited with Julian. And he said, as he left the house, he wanted to do something to give the boys some comfort. He said, who I felt bad for was the kids. The kids of divorce, they go through a lot of things that are difficult for them to process. And he said, I just wanted to do something for Julian to make him feel better or to offer him some comfort. In the next month or so, Paul wrote this song, and then he recorded it, and it became their biggest hit ever in the United States. This morning, if you will, turn to the book of Jude. You had to know that I was going to go there, right? I mean, unless you forgot that there was a book of Jude, I suppose. Uh, There is only one chapter in the book of Jude little book right before Revelation. If you reach Revelation, you've gone too far, turn back one page. Jude, verse, beginning with verse 1. Jude, beginning with verse 1. Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I ask in the next few moments that you will speak to each of us through this small book of Jude. We want to learn what your servant was writing to them in that moment and what he also writes to us 2,000 years later. Speak to each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was younger, I would get distracted by other stuff happening and I would leave items in places where I was not originally taking them. So I was returning a pair of scissors to the kitchen, but I would walk through the living room and the TV would be on and I would watch something, and after a few minutes I would get up and make my way onto the kitchen, arriving to find that I no longer possessed the scissors that I was returning there. I was notorious for doing this with my shoes. I would drive my mom crazy because she would say, put your shoes on, and I would have my shoes on, put my shoes on in the living room, and then I'd get distracted somewhere else. I'd go back to my room. I'd go to my sister's room, and then she said, we're ready to leave, and I realized I don't have my shoes on, and I no longer know where my shoes are located at that point. <laughs> I feel like I have a pretty organized mind, but when it comes to those things, items, somehow I find myself constantly li- leaving them lying around. All those years later, I continue to frustrate my wife now (laughs) with the aspect of this, my wedding band. 
which I fidget with often, and I take off, and I do that to my finger, and then I put it back on, and I'll take it off. I have dropped this in movie theaters, <laughs> and it clink, 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 and you can hear it roll down the aisle. She's like, we're getting a divorce, and I'm like, I know, <laughs> totally justifiable, right? So, so I, and I take this off often after my shower. I take it off. I'll leave it somewhere, saying to myself, I'll be back to put that on in just a moment. Then I'll leave it on the nightstand, on the bed, on the bathroom countertop. Courtney will inevitably send me the exact same text every time. There's no context with text, right? You can't hear it. You can just read the words. But listen to me. I can hear it. <laughs> the text comes, two words, just two words, dripping with sarcasm. The text arrives. Forget something? That's all she ever texts me. And I would be like this, go, oh, the ring, right? So I have to send her this wonderful text back. I'm so sorry. I forgot it. And I give her excuse every time. We've been married for 25 years almost. I give her excuse every time. Well, what happened was I was doing this and then this led to this. She never responds. She just sends me, forget something. And then I know I have to bring flowers home that night. So the book of Jude is that. That is the book of Jude. Jude says to them, guys, I was going to write you about the salvation that we all have through Christ Jesus. But I realized that we've got a bunch of heretics that have creeped into the church that are teaching wrong doctrine, that are teaching heresy. So he says, I'm going to deal with that instead. And he does. And he never comes back to the idea of salvation for all through Jesus Christ. He says, this is what I was going to write about, but I've got this thing and I have to deal with this thing. And he deals with it for the rest of the book and he never returns to. Look again at verse 3. I, will, I wanted to be diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. But he says, now I've got to deal with something else. And he does. And he never returns to the common salvation. I always think that they wrote back to him and say, forget something. So... <laughs> So that's what Jude deals with. Now, Jude is, is an excellent writer in this sense. And this is what I want you to understand as we work our way through Jude this morning very quickly. But I want you to understand this. What Jude easily could have done was begin to name specific heretics, specific men and women, and the specific doctrine that they were teaching. Don't listen to this guy. Don't listen to this woman. Don't listen to them. They're teaching this. They're teaching that. He could have easily done that with this book. But the problem would have been 2,000 years later, nobody would have known what those names meant. Nobody would have known what those people were teaching. It would no longer have been relevant to us 2,000 years later, because if he names a bunch of people in the early church, how would we know who those people were? And how would we know what they were teaching? Instead, what Jude does is he tells us how to identify those people. He doesn't deal with the people specifically. Instead, he gives us these three questions to answer. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, is these three questions. He says, let's deal with these three questions, and that will help you identify people that are teaching unbiblical, ungodly doctrine, people that are heretics, people that are teaching stuff that's out and out wrong, people that are teaching things that are sinful. Let's deal with how to identify those people. And that's what Jude does. The first question he asks is, who are they like? That's the first thing that Jude says. He says, all right, who are they like? Have you ever had this happen you meet someone. I do it often because people come to the church and we have guests and, you know, you meet new folks. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and say, oh, you remind me of, oh, you remind me of my roommate from college. Oh, you look just like my next door neighbor. Oh, you remind me from my, of my cousin from Pennsylvania, right? And then they inevitably pull out a picture of the person. And you're like, right? Because you, you think to yourself, wait a minute, I remind you of them? They're like, you're like, what is happening? Wait a minute. I, re you, you, I remind you of them? And they say, yeah, yeah, you look, you look just like them. You remind me of them. And then they bring somebody over. It's always really weird and embarrassing and uncomfortable because they say to the wife, doesn't Travis remind you of my cousin, you know, Rodney? And she's like, yeah, he looks just like Rodney, but I have no context for Rodney. I don't know who their cousin is, what he looks like, how he acts, what he's done. I have no context for that. So what Jude does is he says, 
they remind me of someone. But then he lists three people that all of those people 2,000 years ago would have known, and all of us 2,000 years later still know. Look at verse 11. Woe to them who, these blasphemers that he already talked about, woe to them for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. One of those names should be very familiar. Most of us probably know all three. But let me remind you, Cain is, of course, of Cain and Abel. A- angry, jealous of his younger brother, he murders his own brother. Balaam is not Hebrew. Balaam is a Gentile. He is a magician, a diviner, so to speak, Old Testament. And as the children of Israel are about to enter into the promised land, the king of Moab hires Balaam to curse the children of Israel. And God says, no, you will say exactly what I tell you to say. And so Balaam, instead of cursing them, blesses them because he realizes he can only say what God tells him to say. Finally, Korah is during the time of Moses. Korah rises up in rebellion during the time of Moses. And he says, hey, what's so great about Moses? Why can't I be a leader as well? So what Jude says is not, let's deal with specific people. He says the people that are teaching this heresy, people that are teaching blasphemy, people that are teaching ungodly and untrue, unbiblical principles, they are like Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Cain, what was his issue? Cain's issue was jealousy. Jealousy. He was mad because God had accepted Abel's sacrifice and not his. The wording of Genesis is difficult to understand why the sacrifice was not accepted. What we know about Cain, what happened later, the feeling being that God didn't receive the sacrifice because Cain didn't give it with the right spirit, with the right attitude, with the right heart. Cain became jealous of who Abel was and destroyed him. Be careful of the people that you allow in your life to speak into your life that have all these levels of ongoing jealousy towards everybody else. See, I can't, see, I'm, the, I'm in the same way with Jude. I can't go through and list every heresy, every cult, every blasphemer. Well, this isn't biblical, that's not biblical. It's the same reason I don't preach on specific sin because I could stand up here for a week, 24 hours a day for a week nonstop and name one sin after another and at the end of it, Almost assuredly, I I wouldn't have named a sin that somebody in here has, and they go, hallelujah, I knew that wasn't a sin, right? That's exactly how it works. Well, he didn't name my thing. Thank God he didn't name my thing. So that must not be a sin. So I don't want to go through and list thing after thing after, well, if this person says this is blasphemy, if they say that is blasphemy, listen to me. We're dealing, Jude is exactly right in the template that he lays for us. Do not allow jealous people to have intimate access to your life. If someone's around here and they say say to you constantly, well, why does Sylvia get to run the prayer team? Why is Sylvia in charge of the prayer team? She's not more spiritual than anybody else. Why is she a better prayer? Why does she get to do it? Or they say, why does Tim get to do men's ministry? Tim gets to do it just because he's Travis's friend. I can't believe let Tim run men's ministry. If you have someone like that that you're hearing those kinds of things from on a regular basis, you need to be very, very, very wary of them. Second is Balaam. Balaam, his issue is greed. Balaam was paid to do the prophecy. He was paid for the prophecy. Now, I want you to listen to me on this one. I am not talking about the idea of money here. I'm talking about the idea of notoriety of fame. It is never about the man. It is always about the message. It is never about the prophet. It is always about the prophecy. And so if you have people that constantly seem to be operating in the spiritual or the supernatural, but what they want is to bring attention to themselves and who they are and what they have, you need to be wary of them. What does he say? They have gone in the way of Cain. They have gone in the way of Balaam. Finally, the last one, Korah. Korah is 100% out and out rebellion. Korah says, why does Moses get to lead instead of of me? I'm just as good as Moses. 
I can do just as much as Moses does. He says, I want to be in charge. He confronts Moses and Aaron on the trip through the wilderness to the promised land. For those of you who don't remember the story, Korah, finally God says, okay, fine. I'll show you who I've chosen. He says, everybody that's not for Korah, get away from him. And the earth opens up. And Korah and all of his followers, and pay attention to this, and all of their families are swallowed up by the earth. Your rebellion to spiritual leadership placed in your life will not only destroy you, it will destroy the lives of the people that are closest to you. Korah's rebellion didn't just destroy him, it destroyed everybody around him. If you have toxic voices in your life speaking to you from jealousy, from fame and notoriety, and from rebellion, you need to separate yourself from those people. Do not allow those toxic voices access to your life. So Jude says, this is who they're like. Who are they like? Now the second one, Jude says, what do they do? So now he says, okay, we know what they are like. They are like Cain. They are like Balaam. They are like Korah. But now he says, what do they do? Look, if you will, at verse 12, Jude 12. These, meaning these people, these people are spots in the love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds. They are late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. They are raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. They are wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So next, when he says, what do they do? Jude uses five examples from nature. And I want to go through them very, very quickly. Very, very quickly, but I want you to see them. The first, he says in verse 12, they are spots in your love feast. The better translation there is rocks or reefs. Love feast is communion. That's the same thing that we celebrate 2,000 years later. So the church was getting together for communion. And Jude says, what you're doing is you're getting together. Let's say he says, for example, you're getting together for on a boat on a lake, and you're going across this lake, and these people that speak heresy, these people that speak blasphemy, they are hidden rocks or submerged reefs. They are under the surface of the water. You cannot see them, but when you run over over them, they split open the boat, and everybody on the boat drowns. Everybody on the boat perishes. They are spots or rocks in the communion. So they are these hidden dangers that will destroy the entire boat. Next, look what he says. Verse 12, they are clouds without water. Clouds without water. Clouds without water. The promise of relief, but no actual rain. Years and years ago, when I first got here, we had a couple that showed up within a few months of being me being the pastor of this church. And uh, I think Luke and Janet are the only two of us that are left. Luke will know who I'm talking about. I won't name names though, because that doesn't help. Jude told us that already. There's no reason to name names. <laughs> These people wanted to be involved in everything. They wanted to help with everything. They seemed super helpful, super, oh, we want to serve. We want to do this, we want to do that. I said, great. We had limited people at that time, limited finances. I was looking for passionate volunteers, right? They attended one local outreach and immediately told me and the guy that was running the local outreach program at the time how they thought it should be run and how much better it would be if they were in charge. And then they came to Luke and demanded that Luke let them sing on stage. And then they went to women's ministry, and she wanted to be in charge there, and it went on and on and on and on. Listen to me. They were clouds without rain, man. They were clouds without rain. The promise of of moisture, the promise of life, the promise of provision, the rains have to fall for the crops to grow. But they were clouds without rain. Next, what does Jude say? They are trees without fruit. They are trees without fruit. Twice dead, pulled up by the roots. The people in your life, what are their fruits? What do they do? Jude says they're submerged rocks that destroy the boat. They are clouds with no rain. They are trees with no fruit. Next, look at this, 13. They are waves of the sea foaming up their own shame. Imagine a polluted beach, and the waves just bring more and more garbage onto the beach. 
More and more stuff piles up until no one can swim in the ocean, no one can visit the beach. The sand is filled with trash and garbage and hypodermic needles and all the rest of it that keeps us from enjoying the beach. They are waves foaming up their own shame, polluting the beach so that no one can enjoy the beach. Do you see what happens there? The waves bring all that garbage up until no one can enjoy the beach. The whole, whatever it is, the family is polluted or the workplace is polluted, or the church is polluted, the community of faith is polluted, the small group is polluted, they continue, the waves just bring trash, garbage, garbage, until the whole thing is unusable for anyone. The final thing, they are wandering stars, the more, uh, more sort of 2,000 year old, or 2,000 year later translation is, they are shooting stars. They are shooting stars. <laughs> They flash brightly through the sky. In my line of work, I cannot tell you how many people will say, oh, did you hear about this guy? He started a church in his garage, and a year later he had 1,000 people, and 10 years later he had 20,000 people in his church. I want to be just like him. And then the whole thing just implodes, usually because of his own sin. The whole thing just implodes. How many people? They're on television. They're writing books. They're famous. Everybody knows their name. And then their own sin, their own, dealt, their own undealt with addiction, the own stuff that's inside of them implodes them and implodes their ministry. They are shooting stars. Wow. But then they're gone. And there's no trace of them left afterwards. Let me tell you someone that I admire greatly in this church. And, and again, as I said, you name specific names, <laughs> and you say, well, why didn't Pastor Travis name me? Well, stay calm. We just talked about rebellion, okay? So <laughs> and, and jealousy. Read, read verse 11 again, okay? Let me tell you somebody in this church that I admire greatly, that I have known for a long, long time, but we only started working with recently. I admire Pastor Donnie so much. I admire Pastor Donnie. You want to know why? <laughs> Pastor Donnie was at church at Winder for more than 30 years. Faithful, obedient, servant, helping people. I cannot tell you how many people tell me now, hey, is Donnie Pennington over at your church? Oh, he helped my family when we were going through this. Oh, I used to go to church at Winder and he helped me with that and he did this Listen to me, Church of Winder didn't have 10,000 people or 1,000 people. It wasn't, it wasn't, but it was, it was substantial. It was real. It was genuine. It was helping people. Be careful of shooting stars. They just, and they're gone, and there's nothing left. Donnie Pennington is a hero of mine. You, you want to be like someone in the kingdom of God, don't be like me. Be like Donnie, okay? <laughs> Donnie's like a real, honest-to-God Christian. And there's not a lot of those in the church, to be honest with you. <laughs> you want to be like somebody? Be like Donnie Pennington. So who are they like? He tells us that. What do they do? He gives us these examples. They're submerged rocks. They're trees without fruit. They're clouds without rain. They're all this stuff. Now here's where the great part about Jude ends. Too often, <laughs> very often, you get people that give you all the problems, all the stuff that's wrong with it, and no solutions, no answers. Well, that's the list of everything that's wrong. You see that all the time, right? Well, this is the, what's wrong with the world. This is what's wrong with you know, the country. This is what's wrong with the government. This is what's wrong with the school system. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for coming, right? They're like, here's a laundry list of all the things that's wrong with this country. Thanks so much. Right? And they just walk off stage. Jude doesn't do that. He tells us, he says, this is who they're like. This is what they do. They destroy, they're blasphemers, they preach heresy, they don't believe in Jesus. They do all this stuff. But the final question that he answers is, how do we respond? And this is the most important one. And I want you to see this. How do we respond? Look at verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing is the truth of the Bible. We have the words that were spoken, not only by Jesus, but by his apostles. The first thing we use to combat heresy, to combat 
And not just heresy, just toxic people, people that want to pull you away from the church, pull you away from God, people that want to destroy your, your family, your marriage, your work relationships, people that want to destroy destruction. The first thing that we use to combat that is the truth that is the Bible. Next, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Those are the next three. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith. So the first is the truth of the Bible. The second is we build our faith. How do we build our faith? You say again, yeah, but okay, that sounds great. How do I build faith? Jude then answers that for us. We build faith by praying in the Holy Spirit and keeping yourselves in the love of God. Prayer, love. Truth of the Bible, build your faith. How do we build our faith? Prayer, love for God, love for others. That is the final question. How do we respond? How do we respond when people try to destroy, when people try and gossip, when the jealousy, when rebellion, when hidden rocks threaten to destroy the ship, when the rain that we need, there's no rain because it's empty clouds, when it looks like great trees, but there's no fruit, when it's, when it's all of these things, what do we do? How do we respond? Truth. That is the Bible. Faith. Prayer. Love. Truth. Faith, prayer, love. Let me close with this. Jude is a short book, and we'll keep this short as well. In around 200 BC, the city and the empire of Rome faced their, up to that point, their greatest challenge. It was from a city in North Africa called Carthage. Carthage was the second most important city in the world at that time. Rome, the most important. Carthage, second most important. And Carthage was a trading port, and they had an army, and they were both located on the Mediterranean Sea, Rome on the peninsula of Italy, Carthage in North Africa, and they were destined to collide. They wanted to control the same ocean and the same land and the same people and the same trading routes. And the most famous of all the generals of Carthage was Hannibal. Hannibal. And Hannibal invaded Spain and moved through Europe and fought the Roman armies in what we now call the Punic Wars. Hannibal was an amazing, amazing general. Of all of the generals in the ancient world, probably Alexander the Great and Hannibal were the two most talented. They could manipulate armies and win battles and had strategy and could see further than anybody else could see. And Hannibal won battle after battle. He, he marched his troops and elephants over the Alps and came down into Italy and invaded Italy, moving closer and closer to Rome. The Romans fighting him in battle after battle and losing battle after battle after battle. Finally, they fought at the Battle of Cannae, which is probably the most, one of the most famous battles of the ancient world. And it was the, up until that point, the biggest defeat of the Roman army ever. Historians estimate that Rome lost between 50 and 70,000 soldiers at that battle. Think about that. He decimated them. He destroyed them. The Roman generals went back to Rome and they said, we cannot beat this guy in a battle. They said, what are we going to do? And the Romans decided, we can't fight him at what he does. We can't beat him doing what he does. We have to reinvent warfare. And the Romans begin on a war of attrition, guerrilla warfare. They attacked Hannibal and his troops at night. They burned the crops in front of them. They refused to meet Hannibal in pitched battle. And so Hannibal moved from place to place, not finding the supplies that he needed. The Romans then attacked his supply routes and they fought this guerrilla warfare war of attrition. And finally, they defeated Hannibal. They destroyed him, and Rome won the Punic Wars, and Carthage was never to be again. But Hannibal was actually the better general. Hannibal was actually the better strategic thinker. Hannibal was actually the smarter, more talented tactician. 
and yet the Romans won because they realized we cannot use his tactics to win this war. I say all that to say the same is true of us. The most important question that we answer is the last one. How do we respond? How do we respond? They attack us out of jealousy. They rebel. They want to destroy us. They want all of these things. Who are they? What do they do? Rocks waiting to sink our ship. Trees with no fruit. Shooting stars that offer no substance. If we respond in the natural, we will lose. We will lose. The toxic people at your work, possibly toxic people in your family, if we respond in the natural, we will lose. We must respond radically different to them. As we are attacked with jealousy, we cannot respond with more of the same. How do we respond? Truth, faith, prayer, love. Truth, faith, prayer, love. I didn't give it to the guys, so it won't come on the screen, but I want you to see Jude 19. Jude verse 19 says this. These are sensual persons who cause divisions because they do not have the Spirit. They are sensual persons who cause divisions because they do not have the Spirit. They respond in the natural and the sensual. We must respond in the spiritual. It's not always fun to let somebody attack you and you have to say, well, I got to go pray some more. But that's like how it works. We respond. They attack us. We respond with love. They attack us with lies. We respond with the truth that is the Word of God. They cannot attack us because... In the, they cannot attack us in the spiritual because they're sensual. If we are in the spiritual, we must not attack them in the sensual. We have to rethink the warfare that we use. How do we respond? Truth, faith, prayer, and love. For 2,000 years, there have been toxic people in the church. For 2,000 years, we've been trying to figure out how to deal with them and what to do. The answer has been here the entire time. We fight our battle with truth, with faith, with prayer, and with love. Do that. We are not sensual. We are spiritual. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your presence. I ask that you would be with every person, that you would minister to them and encourage them, strengthen them. All of us have people in our lives that cause division, that are toxic, that cause destruction. God, help us not to, help us not to fall to their level. Help us not to respond in the sensual, but instead to win the battle in the spiritual. God, help us to pray more, to respond with more love, to allow the truth of your word to fill us and to build up our faith. We are spiritual. Help us to respond in the spiritual. I pray this over every person here. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. Now, before I let you go, the book of Jude has the greatest closing prayer of any book in the entire Bible, in my opinion. And I wanna pray it over you. This is the closing prayer or doxology from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Live in the Spirit.